Open your Bibles this morning to the, again the book of Mark, or perhaps you had them already open from Mark reading, but Mark chapter 8. We're going to read that again in just a moment. I do want to wish you a happy Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, of course, celebrates the entrance of Jesus. Uh, I, I like to use the word coronation. I don't know that's quite the right word because they did not make him king, but they were welcoming him in as the king when they laid down the palm branches and he rode in on a donkey, and that is the Sunday before Easter, and so we celebrate Palm Sunday. It also begins Passion Week, what is known as Passion Week, the week of Passion of Jesus. And I'm not preaching on Palm Sunday this morning. I'm going to continue preaching in the book of Mark where we have been. And next week we'll shift a little bit uh, to the Easter or resurrection story of the empty tomb. But I do want to just share with you, for those who don't know or just remind us, that it is Passion Week. And I, I, pray that, I pray that God speaks to you every day and reminds you every day of what he's done. I, I pray that he reminds you every day and that you tell others every day or live out every day the power of the resurrection and what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And Palm Sunday certainly is a time to remember that. And Passion Week is a time to focus on that but during Passion Week of course Jesus enters into Jerusalem on the donkey uh, he also different things that he did while there uh, cleansed the temple of course you remember he drove out the money changers flipped over the tables because they were turned this is the second time he had done this he did this at the beginning of his ministry and he does it at the end of his earthly ministry where they were cheating people and they were turning a place of worship into a den of thieves. Of course, there's also the story about him cursing the fig tree, and he tells several parables along the way during the week. And then, of course, we often think of the, the Last Supper, uh, the Lord's Supper, we call it, or the Last Supper that he had with his followers in the upper room that was prepared. And there, of course, is where he washed the disciples' feet. It's also there where he said, one of you is going to betray me. It's there where Judas dipped his hand in the sop, as they say. Uh, there identifying Judas, and Judas goes out and betrays Jesus. And Jesus then leads the disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane and, of course, prays there. Uh, and there are several times of prayer, and, of course, that's where he takes Peter, James, and John a little further in. And then Jesus, of course, there during that time, pray is not my will, but thine be done as far as, Lord, if it be your will, this cup pass from me, uh, then let it pass. But if not, my will be, or that I will rather, be done. And of course, Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. He's betrayed by Judas. He's arrested by the Romans. And then he goes through several stages of mock trial. Uh, before Caiaphas, and before the Sanhedrin, before Pilate on a couple different occasions, and before Herod. And of course, then the very people that were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, cry out, crucify him, crucify him at the end. And of course, Jesus is crucified. And then of course, uh, on the third day, being the first day of the week, is Easter, and Jesus rose from the grave. I chose not that passage this week again, but I continued to, to be here in Mark. And the reason for that really was because we get kind of the same theme in that Jesus is now asking, or in this passage, in the title, Who is Jesus to you? Because Jesus asked the disciples, Who do people say that I am? And then he asked, Who do you say that I am? And so while the people that were laying down palm branches and crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, said with their lips, he's the coming king, he's the anointed, he's the Messiah, didn't mean it because later they were crying, crucify him, crucify him. And there's some significance between what we say and what we truly believe. And Jesus was asking them, what do you really believe? 
And so that's what we find here in this passage. And so I'm going to ask you again, you can do this while seated, but I want you to hold your Bible up over your head. Take your Bible and lift it up. Raise it up. Repeat with me or say with me, this is the word of God. I will read it, I will believe it, and I will obey it by the grace of God. We'll say that one more time, and then as we go farther forward, we'll just say this one time, because you all know what I'm doing here, but let's say it one more time. This is the word of God. I will read it, I will believe it, I will obey it by the grace of God. Mark 8, beginning again in verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up, and he said, I see men as trees walking. And after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, who do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, or that's Elijah there. And others said, one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye, whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, thou art the Christ. And if we read the same passage over in Matthew, or the same story over in Matthew, he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God and he charged him that they should tell no man of him let's pray again father I pray that you would help us to understand this passage that you would help us to truly believe God is that we enter into this passion week that you would impress upon us that you would examine us that you would help us to not just believe but to tell people what we believe and to seek what they believe so that they may be told and know and understand the truth of who you are and who your son is. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. As we begin this question of who do you say that I am, I think it's fitting that we be, he begins this or he follows up the miracle with that question and so forth. Therefore, let us begin with the miracle. Once again, we see Jesus doing what only Jesus can do. Once again, we see Jesus reaching out outside of the, his home, if you will, outside, not people who are just like him, but also we see that people are bringing people to him. And again, the whole thing of reaching out and then bringing in is both parts we need to be doing. But here they is this, and he comes across this man as they're going about the way. As, as they're in, they cometh to the town of Bethsaida. And in Bethsaida, we're going to read a little bit more about that in just a minute. I'm going to show you something interesting about that. Because when we read this miracle of this man being healed who was blind, that ought to remind us of where we were just a few weeks ago or even just last week. The purpose of the miracle and the giving sight to the blind was one of the signs, not just I can do miracles, not just I have power, but the, one of the signs of the Messiah. We went back and we looked at the Old Testament prophets and they said one of those was restoring the sight to the blind. And so therefore it's no coincidence that Jesus is asking them after doing a miracle Proving who he was, he asks, who do people say that I am? Now, Jesus healed at least five blind people uh, in the Gospels. There's five that we hear about, two at one time, and then there's three other individuals that are healed of blindness. This one was different, and really all of them you could say are different, 
But there's some significant things about this that are different. As he heals the blind, showing again his, the sign of the Messiah. Number one, as we read this, it's interesting that Jesus healed the man gradually. When I say gradually, I mean it was in a, in a matter of a few moments. But here it was, here's Jesus who has the power to heal people with a touch. Or for someone to touch him to be completely healed, for someone to be healed or raised from the dead with a touch. But even more than that, he could say a word and people who were miles away would be healed. And so now it's interesting to me that here we have a man who is being healed not at one moment, and it's almost like he partially heals him and then he continues until he's fully healed. Why, why, why do we see this? And I think when we're reading our Bible, we ought to say, well, that's interesting. Why did Jesus do it that way? Not that we don't believe Jesus did it that way, but simply there must be some significance to this. And there's some things we can know for sure. There's some things we can say, well, we can't know for sure. And ultimately we just say, well, that's how he did it. But could it have been because of a lack of faith in the city around him. There are some scholars that say, well, in Bethsaida, they were particularly short in their faith. And I'm going to show that to you um, in just a moment. But perhaps it was the lack of faith around him. Now, we know that Jesus went into some places and could not do many miracles because of their lack of faith. But I don't know that that revolved around the lack of faith of people surrounding as so much as lack of the faith of the people that were seeking or that had the problem. Or could it be that the spiritual condition of the man himself was in such array or such out of step that it was a gradual process? Well, that doesn't make any sense to me either because Jesus certainly can heal anybody at any time. Jesus was part of or the author, if you will, of creation. All things were created by him. And so therefore, it's certainly not a limit to his power. But I think most likely what's happening here is just what we see in our lives every day or we need to understand in our lives every day. Jesus doesn't deal with every person the same way, the same time, the same timetable, the same fashion. Jesus works in our lives differently. While one person, he may just say, hey, just be seen, and your eyes are open. Others, he spits in their eyes, or another, he takes mud and puts it on their eyes, and whatever it might be, Jesus does things differently. Just as the deaf man, he stuck his fingers in his ears and he touched his tongue, Jesus does things differently. And just because you, we have to be careful about this, just because Jesus did something for you in a certain way doesn't mean that he's going to necessarily do it in the same way for somebody else. Doesn't mean that he can't heal somebody. Doesn't mean that he can't meet a need. Doesn't mean that he won't meet a need. But it doesn't always happen the exact same way for everybody. Now, when it comes to salvation, he cleanses the sin the same way every time as far as you're saved. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross, and therefore you are fully forgiven of sin. But in the miracles he's doing, it wasn't the same from everybody. It's also different because this person was not blind from birth. We saw previously a man who was blind, and there are places where Jesus healed somebody that was blind from birth. This person apparently was not. You say, well, preacher, how do you know that? Again, this is where we look in the Bible and we read, and then we can say, well, this is what I think. All right, this is what the preacher thinks. The reason I think he was not blind from birth is because he knows what a tree looks like. He knows what a person looks like. When we read it, it says, he touched, he, he, he looked up and he said, I, verse 24, uh, he put his hands on him and he asked me if he saw aught in verse 23. And in verse 24, he looked up and he said, I see men as trees walking. In other words, they were blurry. Uh, I, I can see images of people walking, but they look like just big, great tree trunks walking around. I can't see features is the idea of what he's saying. Well, how does he know what anybody looks like unless it's something where he lost his sight due to a sickness, due to a sin, due to a disease, whatever it might, some kind of accident. We don't know. But apparently he had some form of sight before 
because he knows what things are supposed to look like or identify what things are. And then, of course, Jesus does continue and heals him and heals his son. There's something else that's interesting, and this is where I think there's some significance between this point and then the question that Jesus asks. He takes him out of the city to do this. Now, he takes the man out of the city of Bethsaida. Why? Most everybody else, he healed them right there in the city, or right there where they're at, he healed them. Well, again, let me give you some possibilities. It could be that, the, again, we know the crowds were beginning to follow him. We know that people were trying to make him king, or were, there was a rising of support to make him king. And maybe he was taking him out of the city to avoid the crowds, to avoid the attention. That's why throughout the Gospels we see him telling people, don't tell anybody that I healed you, because he realizes that as more and more people realize who he is or who he might be, then therefore they're going, they're going to get it wrong thinking he's going to come and be king now, and that's not what he came for. Uh, we don't understand this a lot of times as Americans, but in Judaism or Jews, they had been taught or believed, rightly or wrongly, it had been taught them that when the Messiah came, he was going to come and set up his throne then. He was going to throw off the shackles of the oppressors then. And so therefore, the Jews of that day thought the Messiah is going to come, he's going to throw off the Roman oppression, and he's going to lead us back to greatness as a nation. And that's not what he came for the first time. That's what he'll come for the second time, and he will set up his kingdom and rule and reign for a thousand years apiece, and then he will rule and reign after that forevermore. But the Jews thought this is what he's coming for, and so therefore he was avoiding the confusion by taking him out of town. That could be one possibility. But look with me. This is where, as you read your Bible, start tying things together, connecting dots. Look with me. Hold your place in Mark. But look with me back in Matthew. When you read the name of a town, as you're reading through your Bible, I encourage you, make notes. And there's different ways you can do that. But again, notice when you see a city or you see a phrase repeated or whatever it might be, write that down. But in Matthew chapter 11, we see something said about the city of Bethsaida. In Matthew 11, we see this in verse 21. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. That's the same city where, that, where he took him out of. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in that day than for thee. Now, Tyre, Sidon, Sodom, we can, we can, we're not, I don't have time to get into all that. We know what Sodom is. We know what they were, how they were destroyed along with Gomorrah. And the point is this. Jesus is saying the city of Bethsaida has had so much evidence of who I am. And they have rejected and rejected and rejected. And so therefore, it's reached the point where I'm not going to give any more signs to Bethsaida. They've been judged. I'm not going to reach out to them anymore. And he said, well, wait a minute. Why wouldn't he send this guy back in Bethsaida to be a witness? Because he had already been rejected. It ought to alert us to the fact that there are people in this world, and I pray that none of us ever, if you're sitting here in the sound of my voice, come to the point where God has said, I have knocked and I have knocked and I have knocked. I've given you sign after sign after sign. You've had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, and that's it. It's done. No longer will you have an opportunity. Don't let that day come for you if you've not chosen Jesus yet. Don't let that day come for you. 
But that's what was going on here, and that's why he took him, or at least in part, why he took him out of Bethsaida. He said, well, preacher, are you sure of that? I'm pretty sure. Now, again, I can say this is still my opinion, but I'm trying to warn you because in a moment, Jesus is going to ask, so who do you disciples say that I am? And he's asking you today, church member, church attender, who do you say that I am? Because if we go back to Mark 8, we see this. Not only did he take him out of the city, but he said, don't go back into the city. Look if you would. And he went down and it, sa it says in verse, um, restored his sight. The man saw clearly and he sent him away to his house. Apparently his house was not in Bethsaida. Apparently he didn't live in the village. He says, but don't go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. And he said, well, that's because he didn't want to cause a crowd. I think it's because of Matthew chapter 11. You're not going to get any more signs. I don't want you to go back and tell them. Now, friends, we got to be very careful. There are some people that we tell and we tell and we tell and we tell, and they reject and they reject and they reject and they reject. Now, we're not God, and so we don't know if they've reached that point. So therefore, I'm not going to tell you, well, just stop telling them. They've had their chance. No. I don't think that's what we're, the message for us today. But understand this. You know who some of those people are, not knowing whether they've reached that point of no more signs for them, but you know there are people in your family, in your neighborhoods, in your workplace that you cross paths with that they have rejected and rejected. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to know about it. And my point is this. Not that we shouldn't keep telling, but don't pull your hair out. Don't bang your head against the wall. Yes, tell. We don't know whether they've reached this point or not. We're not the ones that say, okay, they've, that's it. No more for you. That's not our job. Our job is to tell. But I also understand that there's a point where we get to where we're just, man, I just get so frustrated. Don't allow yourself to get so frustrated that you blow your testimony, blow your cool, because you've gotten to a debate with somebody who's had clear opportunity to hear the truth over and over and over and see God working over and over and over, and they still reject. I think I said this the other week, but I'll say it again. There, are, there is so much evidence that Jesus lived that Jesus died, and even that Jesus rose, that w there are people that don't want to be convinced. It's not a matter of not enough to convince them. It's I don't want to be convinced because if I do, that changes everything. And in that light, can I just give you a new tool for sharing a testimony or witnessing to people? Something else that I'm starting these, I'm, I'm going to try to give you some more of these, and I ask people, I think I've shared this before, I'm going to share it again, I'm going to give you a couple very quickly. One, when you are sharing about the good news of Jesus Christ, I often, do, I often will do this, I will say, someone says, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, well tell me how you got saved, or tell me how you came to Christ. Because people that are Christians love to tell how they came to Christ. If you're a true believer, and I come up to you and say, I'm not questioning whether you're saved or not. I'm simply saying, well, that's wonderful. How did you get saved? I love to hear testimony of how somebody got saved. If you come up and ask me, I love to tell about how I was in revival when I was 12 years old and how God spoke to me and I realized I didn't know for sure that I was saved. I love to tell that. And so do you. I'm sure you, if, if you know you're saved, you love to tell. But then if somebody, it's either somebody doesn't want to tell or if someone tells then they're like, well, I grew up in church. My mom and daddy uh, took me to church all my life, and I just know I'm on my way to heaven. I say this, if that's not how you get to heaven, would you want to know? Would you want to know? And if God is working in their heart, they will, well, no, that's not right. Yeah, I want to know. And you can tell them how they can know. If they say, no, I don't want to know, I, that's how it is, and I don't, then at that moment, there's no sense in really wasting your breath. The other thing is this. When someone says, well, I don't believe that, or I'm not convinced of that, ask them this question about Jesus being the Son of God, if Jesus being the only way to heaven. And they say, well, I'm just not convinced of that. 
Just saying than this, if I could prove to you 100% without doubt right now that it was true, would you accept Jesus? Would you accept it? If I could prove it 100% without a doubt. If they say, well, no, then they don't want to know. And as you know, good to go continue to bang your head against that. Well, that doesn't mean don't go back and tell them again later on. It doesn't mean don't live out your testimony. But my point is this, is trying to determine, is God working in their heart? There are people where, uh, and I'll just go ahead and use it. Uh, Landon has a, a, a friend, a, a college teammate that he's been witnessing to. And the person has asked question after question after question after question. That's God working in his heart. And then all of a sudden, he stopped asking questions. And all of a sudden, he moved out and moved to help another roommate. And part of it was to help this other teammate who needed another roommate. But I asked Lane the other day, I said, have you had any more chance to talk to this person? And he said, I, I, he said I've, I've been around, but he hasn't asked any more questions. We really haven't had a chance to have a conversation. It's because God's convicted him. I believe with all my heart, God's convicted him. And now he's afraid. Of what might happen. Landon has another roommate who's come to him and said, Hey, I'm no longer Catholic. I believe what you believe. God is God will use you. Just in sharing a testimony, people will come and ask questions. But if they're having trouble, ask them, if I could prove to you, would you believe? Or if what you're telling me and how you're going to get to heaven is not correct, would you want to know? There are ways that we can reach out to people in love, in compassion, but this town no longer wanted to know. They people there they had rejected and rejected and rejected. And Jesus said, don't even go back and tell them. What a terrible place to be. And my question for you leads to this question. You guys are here. You've had opportunity after opportunity. There's not anybody in this room that has not had the chance to hear my voice on more than one occasion or the voice of God on more than one occasion from the word of God on more than one occasion. And so the question comes then, it's pointed, who do you say that I am? Now, Jesus started out by asking the disciples in the verses that follow as they're walking along the way in Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, by the way, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? So who do people say that I am? Now, here's the thing. When I'm about to ask you is who do, people, who do, who do you say that I am, or that's what Jesus then says, who do you say, less important is who do people think. Who do the others? Look at your neighbor for a second. Look at your neighbor. Turn and look at the person sitting next to you. Look at him. Look at him. That's right. I know you may not like them that much, but you know, you look at them anyway. You chose to sit by them. One reason or another. All right? What they believe about Jesus does matter. It is important for them. Not really for you. You see, sometimes we become so caught up in what everybody else believes, and I want to be part of the majority or part of the popular opinion, or, or I want to be part of the... And so therefore, we get caught up in the opinions of others. And it does matter, but not as much as it matters what you believe. It matters because once you believe, then you want to make sure the person sitting next to you or the person you cross paths with, you want to try to make sure they believe. But people have different opinions. God's given us a free will, a free choice. He's given us evidence of creation. He's given us all kinds of signs. He's given us all kinds of wonders. He's given us God's word for us today. But it's a pointed question. Who do people say that I am? But here's the thing. I think the word say here throws us off. Who do, what do people say that I am? What's more important? You guys can answer this out loud. What people say or what they really believe? Believe. When we read this, it's almost it's like, well, what, what, are people, what are people saying? I think that's the thought of what do people say? But then he turns to them and he says, what do you say? And by say, the word is what do you confess? 
or what are you convicted of? The word there for say, it's, it's what, what is your confession? It's not just something that, well, just off the cuff, but what do you really believe? People can say all kinds of things. The people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna on Palm Sunday. The day that we're remembering this Sunday, Palm Sunday. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. The king is here. But just a few days later, crucify him, crucify him. Oh, far more important than what we say is what we really believe. Far, far more important than what we say is what we do. Far more important than what we do is what we believe. Now, most times what we believe is what we will follow through on and what we will do. But even more important than what you do, because people can put on a show, they can put on a front, they can put all the actions out there. But what do they believe? I, most of you know that I had a rough 10 days as far as pain-wise and everything. It's with my back. Last week you heard me mention that. And then I had... Uh, What's it called, Tracy? It's not, not, not grout, but gout. I think possibly gout in my, in my foot. And so I had a rough week this week. And I told, you know, Tracy and the kids, and we were kind of laughing about something. It wasn't that funny to me, but they were laughing about my moaning and my groaning. And Lucas has a pretty good impersonation of me. And I was like, I admit that there is at times that I can get bit, be a bit dramatic. You know, I do it for, you know, attention or I, you know, I'll cry out for attention or just to make them laugh or whatever, just to, you know, just kind of get giggles out of them. I will do that. And I said, but this pain was so bad that I was in my car and nobody could see me or hear me and I was still screaming out. In other words, I wasn't doing it for someone else to hear me. I wasn't acting it out so someone else would say, oh, are you okay? I was by myself in tears. I was by myself throbbing. I was by myself saying, I'm taking myself to the hospital. I don't know what this is. That's because I believed something was wrong. What do you believe? What do you believe? Actions can betray what you believe. Opinions can be different than what you truly believe. But Jesus takes it, and it's a pointed question, but then he turns around and he makes it personal. Who do you say that I am? And, whether, and you're in here today, and whether listen, this may be Preacher Jonathan that's verbalizing it, but I'm telling you, as you read this, that's the word of God, and that's God asking it to each of you. And I'm not doubting whether you're a Christian or not. God's not doubting. God knows the truth. But, but, but you still need to say, ask yourself, who, who, do, who do I say, who do I believe Jesus is? Good person? Prophet? Miracle worker? Teacher? Example? Fairy tale? What matters is that you believe what Peter believed. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter makes a profession. And my point is, before I get to the profession, I just want to get to this. The disciples had as much or more evidence than anybody. If Bethsaida had been said, you've had your chance, Bethsaida, and it's going to be worse for you, Bethsaida, than for Tyre, for Sidon, for Sodom. Because you've had clear opportunity, you've had clear demonstration of who Jesus is. And I would say to Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, you've had clear opportunity. You've had clear presentation. You've seen clear work of God in your lives of who Jesus is. Who is Jesus to you? The only confession that works is that Jesus is Lord. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the promised one. He is a king. He is Lord. People will sometimes seek truth. If they're willing to accept truth, they'll realize who Jesus is. But there's others that want to seek opinions and they'll fall along the wayside. And so for you, is that confession, is it conviction or is it opinion? Your answer determines your eternity because this is a life or death question. 
Your eternity hangs in the balance by how you answer who is Jesus. Yes, we ought to let our conviction drive our decisions, our actions, as Peter did. Peter was convicted and Peter was convinced and he said boldly and uncompromisingly, you are the Christ. That meant the anointed one, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Here's something interesting about the anointed one. Do you know who was anointed in, the, in, in Bible times? It was the priest. It was the king. And it was the prophet would be anointed. Jesus is all three. He is the prophet, Jesus Christ. I mean, he is the son of God. He is the one who knows it all. He's the one that can tell it all. He is the king. And he is our high priest. Oh, that's why he's the anointed one. But I'm telling you, he's also the promised Messiah that came and paid the price of sin for you and for me. And I'm telling you, he's the son of the living God because only the son of the living God, the perfect, the perfect spotless Lamb of God, is the only one who could ever be offered as a sacrifice for our sins. Do you want to know why our works aren't good enough? Do you want to know why nothing we can, I heard, I heard an illustration this week, it was so good. The Bible says that our works are as filthy rags, or refuse, or feces. He said, that sounds terrible. No matter how good our works are, they're not enough. Do you want to know why God doesn't accept them? Now, we, there's a number of reasons we can say, well, it doesn't meet, it can't meet his standard. And certainly there are wrong motivations, perhaps. But even the very best motivations, even the very best actions, the very best works that we could ever do, this is why we have to have Jesus, the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God who paid the price for us, is because whatever you offer up, to Jesus as your work, to God as your work, is held up by hands that have been digging in the toilet. Hands that have been digging in manure. Hands that have been digging in the trash. Now, if I were to come by and you saw me digging in the trash, and you saw me digging in the manure, in the cow patty, if you were, and I were to come and offer you a sandwich... Do you want it? Is that good for you? That's what our works are to him. But when we're saved and out of a pure heart and with clean hands because of the shed blood of Jesus, and even when we've sinned and we do sin, God looks at us and sees our offerings and he doesn't see the filthy hands that have been digging in the trash and in the garbage, but he sees the washed hands, the washed heart, the washed soul, if you will, of the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, my friends, there's nothing we can do. It's all what he's done because he is the Son of God. Is that your confession today? If not, won't you make it that? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us today to understand just who you really are and that our words of, yes, I believe, would not just be our opinion, would not just be our words, but, Father, would be the cry of our heart, would be our convicted belief, convinced, and that turning to you and asking for the forgiveness of sin. We are promised to be forgiven. Let us not be like the city of Bethsaida, a city who had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity and turned Jesus away. Let that not be us. Let that not be anybody in this room or the sound of my voice, I pray. Help us to proudly, boldly, uncompromisingly declare just who you are and just who Jesus is. The Savior, God, 
our master. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.